Welcome to EI family to another episode of the Everyday Investor. Today we have a very special guest. This gentleman has uh, acquired a number of skills over the years. He also invests in the same industries that he helps his very clients out. Please help me welcome Samir Patel. What's going on, Samir? Not much, David. Great to be here. Thanks for the uh, invite. No, for sure. It's great having you. Uh, I always like to kind of talk about a little bit of the goal before we get jumping into jumping into the question and things like that. Uh, a little bit of the goal of the channel. Uh, just trying to help. Uh, I want to present these interviews as like case studies so that uh, I call them the TEI family or uh, the, the, the people who are going to be uh, the audience that are going to be listening and watching the video. Uh, look at them as case studies to try to identify with one or more uh, interviewers uh, and hopefully be able to implement some of the uh, skills or some of the things that you, know, you talk about or others talk about into their life to you know, hopefully have a, a little bit of the success that you were able to acquire up until this point in time. Uh, again, the everyday investors about, you know, is like a kind of twofold type of situation where the first is investing in yourself uh, to at least get a skill that's going to pay you. Uh, it's, you know, I'm a big believer of uh, competency gets compensated. Then the second part of it is not just uh, getting a skill and making a lot of money, but also being able to invest in things whether it's stocks, whether it's bonds, whether it's uh, real estate or businesses, uh, crypto, so forth and so on. So those are like the two parts of the everyday investor. And the goal of the channel is to invest in yourself, to acquire your skill, to increase your earning potential, then also to be able to use that increased earning potential to actually you know, make investments in various industries and various things, whatever your investment vehicle is, so that uh, you can also have a nice nest egg at you no know, retirement once you start to slow down, but also be able to live a... Uh, just a good life, a comfortable life and enjoy life. I know, you know, we talk a lot offline and, uh, and, and you're traveling places here, there, and uh, you're enjoying life. So you're not just working hard, working hard and, you know, wait until this magic retirement day before you get a chance to uh, enjoy life. But you're, you know, working hard, you know, making money, enjoying life, enjoying life now, but also understand that once you get to the back end, uh, you're going to, you know, have a nice nest egg based on the investments that you make throughout your life. So. Uh, that's kind of the goal of things. And with that being said, I always like to go to the to the beginning of things and uh, just kind of talk about uh, where are you from and how did you grow up? And uh, did your parents you know, talk to you about finances, talk to you about investment? How was you know, early life uh, for, for Samir Patel? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'm born and raised in Toronto, Canada. Um, I, I, I went to university um, and did sports management at Brock University, which is in Niagara Falls on the Canadian side. Um, and, and I went to university with the ambitions of, of becoming a sports agent. Okay. And so from there, uh, I decided to, to go to Michigan State University College of Law, which is where you and I met. Um, and the reason to go to Michigan State was because Michigan State has a very rich athletic program. And so I wanted to learn about the law as well as work with the athletic department at Michigan State. And when I was at Michigan State, uh, one, of the, one of the best lessons that I learned there was how to create a niche and to brand yourself because the legal industry is certainly very competitive. And coming from a school like Michigan State, um, the opportunities for working in big law were, were very slim uh, at that time. Now things have gotten better. Uh, but when I was there at Michigan State, in, in, in the efforts of trying to brand myself and create a niche, um, I went on Twitter and created a, a Twitter profile and, and started tweeting about sports uh, and, and the law. And, and through perusing Twitter and the, the different hashtags, I came across blockchain technology. And this was in my second year. And I studied up on, on blockchain technology. Um, and one of the things that you just mentioned, uh, comp uh, competency leads to compensation, certainly um, echoes with, with blockchain technology. So I learned all about it, try to become competent in, in, in the space. And I was able to acquire an offer from Holland and Knight here in Miami. Um, Holland and Knight being one of the, the top 30 law firms on the planet. Um, I was recruited because of my blockchain expertise. And, and so I've been here in Miami for five years after graduation. And, and I've been working in the blockchain space 
um, as far as, so my, my parents are, are first generation um, Indo-Canadians or, or Indians that, that moved to Canada uh, in 1979. And, and so as you could imagine, um, principles of, of saving your money what certainly what was was bombarded on, on my childhood. Uh, my parents certainly did not indulge. Um, they were, you know, blue collar people working an hourly wage, saving their money in order to send my sister and, and I, my older sister and I off to, to higher education and things of that nature. So um, it was always about, you know, saving your money, okay. um, not necessarily about uh, uh, investment. Right. Um, I could tell you with, with a lot of Asians, not just Indians, but Chinese, Japanese, um, <clears throat> Indonesian, Vietnamese, uh, they're, they're pretty risk averse. Uh, they, they like to have their money underneath their mattress, so to speak. Right. Um, and, 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 and I was going to say, is that, and it seems like just even in a, I'm not sure if it's a cultural, maybe it is a cultural thing, because even like in the African-American community, uh, I would say where you're middle class or maybe even lower class where uh, it's big, uh, people are big on uh, saving money or I guess depending on who you're asking, you know, sometimes at least in the African-American commu community, they're big on, we're big on, or a lot of people overspend, which obviously is not a good thing. Uh, but what, like, it seems like it's not a lot talked about investing your money. Uh, and it seems like you're kind of saying the same thing, just kind of based on, of you know, different cultures, different groups. Uh, and I guess, how do you feel about that uh, now, kind of being in a position that you're in? Because I know for me, again, my mom, she just kind of given her situation and what she knew, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, she didn't talk to us about investing and things like that, because that's that was, was a foreign concept to her for the most part. Um, and I love my mom dearly, and she did kind of the best <laughs> she, uh, she had with us. So that's no indictment on my mom. But I think growing up with the uh, kind of that's something that I'll kind of really kind of teach my kids not only to save and not overspend, and but but I think investment investing is a big part of that when you're talking about kind of growing your pot when you're talking about compound interest and things like that. So I guess in your situation, I guess looking back on it. Uh, is that something that you will do differently, you know, when you start to have kids and things like that, as far as not only talking about saving and uh, not overspending, but also, uh, you know, in include that. In I mean, obviously, once the kids get of age to the point where they can understand it. But is that something that you would uh, talk more about uh, if you in that if you are in that parental role as far as uh, investing? Yeah. So financial literacy, when yeah. growing up, financial literacy according to my parents was was just saving your money really? uh, and, and putting it in in in, a, in your bank account or, or wherever what have you financial literacy certainly didn't include lessons regarding investment uh it, whether, regardless of what asset class it is right. um and and it's a product uh it's certainly cultural there's no question about it so in the east indian culture uh you you, you coming here so our parents my parents and, and a lot of people that are like me where their parents migrated from India to Canada, the, the culture uh, at that time and probably still in place is you go to you go to school, you get good grades, you go to a good university, right. you do something in the medical field, yep. you become a doctor or, or a pharmacist. Um, yep. And so you, like you that. have that, that annual income um, where you, you don't necessarily need to evade yourself to to risky investment. So you don't necessarily need to invest your money um, in, in property and buy a lot of property or precious metals or things of that nature because you're making six figures every year. Um, so th the risks that you need to take with your money are, are far less volatile than have you, you know, making five figures and, and saving up for retirement as, as you're alluding to. So. The financial literacy growing up for me was just saving money um, and not necessarily anything like my parents never taught me about investments or anything of that nature. Certainly, um, mind you, the, the, there, there are things that they couldn't ha have have um, uh, forecasted, things like inflation. Right. Um, had they known about, I mean, or had they had a better grasp of 
of inflation and where inflation went. I mean, anybody who had a, a good grasp of where inflation was going would have articulated to, to invest your money. Um, oh. Go ahead. Sorry, uh, yeah, and I was going to say uh, that's a big part of it uh, when you talk about inflation, because inflation is not just a, a U.S. thing. It's not just a Western world thing. Inflation is like a worldwide thing. So I know when you're talking about putting money under you know, a suitcase, I mean, under the bed or you know, underneath the doghouse in the back, whatever the case may be. Obviously, that the value of that money is going down over time as inflation uh, uh, continues to increase. Uh, so, yeah, that, that's definitely a big part of it. And that's interesting. So you're saying that is that was that with your parents specifically or is that just kind of a cultural thing where, you know, inflation and having that grasp of inflation and, and the effects of it is just kind of not as uh, well understood? Well, I, I could certainly talk. I, I can't talk for a lot of people, but I can certainly speak for myself where yeah. where, again, notions of investing and trying to stay ahead of inflation were, were not lessons that I learned. Those were lessons okay. that, that I learned on my own. Right. Uh, so, so, so out of curiosity, and I know we'll kind of get maybe flush this out a little bit more later. So, you know, like you said, first of all, that culture is doing a good job or your culture is doing a good job in terms of not uh, what I call them basket weaving degrees, which we'll get into later. But you're going, you know, and that's a lot of times you see Indian people, they're pharmacists, they're engineers, they're some type of doctor or something in the medical field. So that's a big part of it. When you're talking about the first step, acquiring some type of skill that's going to be well paid for years to come. Uh, but then when you're talking about putting away and saving, they're not investing in stock markets and things like that. It's more so just trying to just save it, just you know, save it as much as possible over the year as you're as you're earning. Well, so my my parents certainly back in Canada certainly invest in, in mutual funds. Okay. And I think that came I think they realized that towards their retirement or at least until gotcha. my father retired. So he started investing in mutual funds. But these are default mutual funds from the bank. They're they're really low risk, yeah. uh, low volatility um, kind of investments that they're you make maybe a couple of basis points a year on them. Um, it's it, when when looking at these investments, I'm sure my father is just looking at whether or not the interest rate from the mutual fund is higher than the interest rate okay. that they would get from their savings account. Yeah, right. um, and my father's really, really old school about it. So he has his mutual fund statement on the fridge um, for everybody to see. I mean, it's just my mom really? at home, but he has it there and like you can take a look at it. He has six figures in it. But it, and he's had it for decades, and it just—I mean—the the basis points on it maybe like a point and a half, two points. Um, but again, though, that reiterates the fact that that their their appetite for risk is really small. Right. They certainly don't want to. I mean, especially now with them the, towards the the the, the tail end mm -hmm. of their working career, um, they have a nice honey pot with that they can. I mean, their house has been paid off. They bought their house in cash back in 1980. Really, um, their cars have paid off. They buy Toyota, so they buy Toyota cars that last for a long time. Right. They buy a car once every fifteen years. Um, they certainly, I mean, they're East Indian, they're vegetarian, so they're, like their 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 grocery bills, you know, are not extravagant. Maybe Animal. like a hundred dollars Canadian a week, if that. Right. Uh, so they certainly spend within their means, uh, and that just goes to solidify the fact that they are not risk adverse. They're they're right. operating within their means. They're very comfortable with where they're at right now. They certainly don't worry about money, um, and they don't have the appetite of, of things like 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 luxury brand goods and, and and cars. I mean, my parents they're they would rather spend money on a TV and a satellite so they could watch Indian uh, channels from back right. home in India. Um, so I, with everybody, and it's certainly cultural as we were talking about, but, but everybody has a certain appetite when it comes to risk yep. and with, with East Indians and in Asians that migrated over to Canada and North America back in the seventies and eighties, their risk appetite is, is certainly smaller. Um, one thing that I can tell you and that I've empirically ha have identified is that Canadians or Indians that moved to Canada are certainly less risk adverse than those Indians that came to the United States. When the, the United States back in the 70s and 80s, and to a certain extent, the, the, it's the same kind of narrative today. But, you know, you come to the United States and you have that American dream. So you start a business and you buy a house, the white picket fence, and you got your, your ideal four person nuclear family with a, with a daughter and a son and you got your dog. And then you just live life ha happily ever after. And certainly things like population 
um, can, you know, come into the equation of your risk appetite. Because in the in Canada, you only have at that time, you only had maybe 20 million people. And so to create a business, how many people are like, is there is there foot traffic outside of your business? And if so, then you're going to be in a metropolitan area like downtown Toronto or downtown right. Montreal or Vancouver. And so your expenses are going up. And so with that, as your baseline expenses, your operating expenses are up, then that kind of is, is an adverse kind of, of, of notion to, to, to creating a business because you're putting all of this money up front. And so that's risky in and of its own self. But here in the United States, a lot of these Indians that came over during the 70s and 80s, they opened up their own businesses because there's a lot more population here in the United States. There's right. a lot of traffic. Uh, and, and so you'll need like convenience stores is one of those kind of, uh, right. of things that you associate with Indian people and motels are, are other kinds of businesses that, that you uh, affiliate with Indian people. And with motels is a perfect example because in Canada, if you own a motel, again, you have 20 million people, how many people are traveling, how many people are, are moving throughout Canada and, and had the need for a hotel or a motel. But in the United States, there's 300 million people and everybody's trying to travel to another state and see another state. So motels are a lot more lucrative business just because of the population. Right. So so there, there's you have to equate that into the risks. And so in Canada, again, I'll, I'll reiterate that the Canadians, the first generation Indo-Canadians like myself, we were told to go into a business or sorry, to go into an occupation that has. Uh, a high paying annual compensation rate right. so if you're in the United States, maybe your parents at that time came here, bought a business. So then they would teach their kids, you know, how to operate a business, how to find a, a good lucrative market to open a business in. Uh, and I've certainly seen that. So my father-in-law, when he came over, he bought a lot of businesses uh, in the United States. And, and he bought a lot of these businesses from, you know, people, incumbent people. So yeah. Caucasian people or African-American people that were here that sold the end up selling their business. A lot of these brown people, a lot of these Indian people bought those businesses up. Um, and, and so it, the border, the, the North American border between Canada and the United States certainly is is what we us attorneys like to call it, like a thick black letter line. In that, and I'm just analogizing, but you can certainly see that there's a different mind shift towards risk and investment between Canadian immigrants and, and American immigrants. And, and it certainly is fostered by this, this notion of the American dream. Right. No, I think that's a man. I think that's a great point. And that's a great distinction between you know, where you are, whether or not it's in uh, uh, Canada or you're coming to America. I think uh, you know, the last guess is uh, folks immigrated from Greece and uh you know, they started a business, a restaurant, and mm -hmm. kind of, you know, built that up and a lot of hard work, that type of thing. But it was all based on this whole American dream and uh, just kind of a better life and, you know, had a family and all all the kids are doing really well, whether it's uh, engine, uh, being an attorney or uh, somewhere in the medical field, a nurse, a practitioner, uh, a doctor, dentist, all those things. So that's interesting. And, and, and it seems like... Uh, uh, and it's, it's always, you know, interesting just seeing, you know, when you come to the uh, United States, as far as just kind of, you're, you're not as, especially coming out, coming here young and experiencing the culture, uh, it's become more of a spender or more of a, just want to live luxurious or kind of do things as opposed to just kind of work and save, work and save. I'm not sure if that's a kind of, are, do you think uh, Indians that are in Canada, even if they're younger, still have that model of just, hey, get up good job, a high paying job and just work and uh, save and, you know, just kind of live below your means and maybe, you know, do some mutual uh, fun stuff here and there and, uh, you know, things will work out in the end or are they more, uh, hey, well, no, we're going to take do, do more risky investments, especially in our younger days when, uh, you know, we have a lot of time to uh, to work. And then as we kind of transition to a retirement age, then we will kind of scale back on uh, our, our investments that are uh, risky and like less risky investments and, to try to you know uh, secure and uh, protect that that nest egg. I could talk about my generation. So my generation, having been born in in the early '80s, uh, my generation certainly now are are more. They have a bigger risk appetite. Right. I know a lot of my friends that are Indian. Um, excuse me. They 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 are investing in different asset classes. Um, mm -hmm. Just because um, a lot of them did 
go through the, the ideal um, process uh, of, of getting that high paying job. So they went to high school, they, they focused on sciences, they went to university, they focused on sciences, and then they got that science job after. And so they have more money, if you will, than our parents. Like, my, for example, my mom, when she came over, she was a data entry uh, specialist for Sears. And now she works at a department store called The Bay in the kids department. And so, you know, she makes about $16, $17 Canadian an hour. Um, and so their, their pot is a lot smaller. Whereas, you know, someone like myself or, or my friends, we, we are now professionals. So we don't make that hourly rate anymore. I mean, that, that's, that's a tip of the hat to our parents um, who definitely taught us the right way. But now when we look at our bank account, there, there's just a lot of money sitting there. Right. And when you see bank interest rates, savings, saving interest rates at 0.01%, and when you couple that with inflation here in the United States, that's growing at 8.3%. Right. It doesn't take it doesn't take a math wizard to understand that you know we're losing eight percent every year with what we're keeping in in our savings account. So a lot of a lot of people in my position right now that are that are children of of, of immigrants, we see that this model that our parents had taught us about saving money and just keeping it in the savings account is literally hindering us from growing our wealth moving forward. So we have to be industrious and try to find new avenues to park our money so that we can make more money off of the money that we already have rather than lose money to inflation in our in our bank account. Right. No, yeah, and I think that's a great point and I, we're definitely going to break that out uh as we go on cuz I, I think that is a great a uh, great point to be able to just kind of learn and understand what our parents taught us and understanding they kind of taught us a lot of things based on their understanding and uh I just be able to try to kind of make sense of it and maybe adjust and modify those teachers as time goes on. Uh, I, I do want to kind of maybe get back to, so you talk about uh, you're in high school or you're kind of matriculating through uh, school and now you decided to go uh, into uh, sports management uh, in Toronto. Now, was that always a thing where, you know, your parents pushed, hey, you know, go get an education, go to college? Because again, I know for a lot of uh, parents, especially uh, immigrants or uh, people who just, weren't didn't have that benefit as they were younger they kind of pushed that on them on, on their kids say hey you want to go get go to college even though they had no idea of uh maybe what the kids should do so for example for me uh, i was thankful enough to get some good mentorship to do engineering but uh, it's a lot of kids who are you no know, they they are told to go to college but they're left uh, uh you no know, without understanding of what to get, what's a good degree to get. So they get what I call a basket weaving degree, whether it's communications or interdisciplinary health studies or something along those lines. And that I think is a, uh, it's a dis puts the kids at a disadvantage once they graduate from college and now they're in a the workforce, try workforce trying to make an earnest living. Did your parents always tell you, hey, go to college and if to go to college, get this particular type of degree? Or was it just, hey, kind of do whatever you want after you graduate high school? No, so my parents had had laid out their their plan for me um, from the beginning. So going to high school, picking courses in high school were were always geared towards sciences. My parents wanted me to become a doctor or a pharmacist during high school. Um, I certainly enjoyed the sciences. I grew up in a science household. Um, all three, my both my parents and my sister went, went did sciences. And so for me, it was always, Samir, you got to do sciences in university. You got to become a pharmacist, got to become a doctor. And uh, so I rebelled. Um, and and, and it, it didn't end up, uh, my road is certainly a long winding road. Right. Um, and so I rebelled during high school. Uh, I, 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 I didn't get good grades during high school. After high school, I went to community college in Toronto as a mature student. So what that means is if you're over 18 years old, you can apply part time to a community college. You do a certain number of credits at the community college and then you can become full time. And so I did that. It was called Seneca College in Toronto. Uh, I did my diploma in general arts. So certainly one of those basket weaving uh, yeah. degrees that you're talking about. 
um, graduated college with the C average, um, certainly was not um, any kind of, uh, of thing that I could put my hat on to get a job with or to get a good paying job with. Um, and so I bounced around from, uh, from job to job during my early and mid twenties. Uh, and then when I was 26, I had the opportunity. And so these jobs were, were predicated around sports and camps and working with kids and community development. Uh, and so when I was 26, I had the opportunity to move out to Western Canada, uh, and live on a native reserve for eight months, working with wow. the kids in the native reserve. Um, teaching them sports, creating grassroots sports programs, sustainable grassroots sports programs. And when I was there, I realized, okay, I need to go back to school. Um, and so that's how my, uh, that's where my journey went, uh, leading to Brock University and getting my undergrad in sports management started off. But certainly, even when, when I was 26 years old and I was talking to my parents about going back to school uh, and telling them I wanted to do sports management, I wanted to be a sports agent, they were exceedingly hesitant um, uh, as a matter of fact, they, they, they try to convince me not to do it. Um, I told them that I wanted to be a lawyer. And, and again, it, it, it's articulating them being risk adverse. And they were like, oh, there's no paying jobs and being a lawyer. It's really, really cutthroat. Um, you're, it's going to be a long time before you get a well-paying job. Uh, and so at the beginning of, of my journey, they, I had to take out student loans. I mean, my parents would help me out here and there, um, but was, I, I certainly had to, had to do this all on my own, getting, getting student loans uh, and paying for my way through university uh, and then law school. Uh, but certainly, certainly my parents did not enjoy uh, the fact that I wanted to become a lawyer. It went against their grain, it went against what they know as being the the a good way of creating of of, of garnishing a career uh, and making a, a livable wage, they they thought that being a lawyer was certainly going to be a lot more hard harder than had I just like done pharmacy uh, or optometry or, or or become a dentist or anything of that of that nature. Right. No, and that, that's an interesting point. I mean, obviously things have worked out. Uh, you know, for the better, or to, you know, things were, have worked out for you. So I'm pretty sure you don't regret kind of the path, even though it was maybe a long winding path. But I guess looking back on it, uh, obviously your parents had reservations about what you uh, did in terms of, you know, not going into pharmacy and uh, some type of, you know, uh, you know, being a doctor or dentist or something in that you know, medical field. And uh, it seems like that's kind of just based on like a cultural thing. Uh, but how, how would you have looking, you know, you know, with your future kids or whatnot, how would you approach that situation if your son or daughter came to you and uh, said, hey, I wanted to do X, Y, and Z, and you, you know, obviously you're going to give them advice and what you think should be the right thing, uh, but how would you uh, approach that situation if they say, no, I'm going to do a basket weaving degree or do something that's you no know, totally goes against the grain? Because it's always, you know, my belief that, hey, you know, as my, you know, kid or kids get old enough and they start going to college, especially if I'm paying for it. I'm going to pay for something that is a, 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 a meaningful degree as opposed to just doing something that uh, is not, you know, at least uh, on its face, is not going to uh, produce a, a, a good living. So how, how would you approach that situation if you were placing your parents' situation looking back on it? So uh, my rule of thumb is just to do the complete opposite of what my parents did. Okay. Um, <laughs> and, and, and listen, so it's, as as uh, the first generation Indo Canadian, I, I would like to think that my parents they came over to Canada wanting to give me a better life and wanting to expose me to, to different options and, and different facets of life and different nooks and crannies about where you can pursue a career. Um, I mean, that's what they thought. I mean, that's that that was their their intention. But then once we got here. Um, they, I'm, I'm speaking for them, but maybe they realize that that there are certain occupations um, that that are that are more lucrative that, than others. And, and listen, our, my parents certainly had ambitions or, or intentions of of me being at this at the station of life that I am right now. They they wanted me to be financially independent and, and work in a respectable occupation. Um, and, and things of that nature. Uh, and, and so they, they pushed it. 
they, they, they would push their narrative onto me, as I alluded to before. Right. What I would do, um, what I plan to do is, is, is just let m- my children live their life. Um, obviously, th- there, are, there are facets of society that I would protect them from. Uh, there, there's advice and, and foresight that I can, uh, that I can give them. Um, uh, but when it comes to my children, and I certainly see this with, with like my niece and nephew, for example, they're born and raised in Chicago. My niece, my nephew is like 11 years old and my niece is five. And my sister and my brother-in-law put my niece and nephew into a myriad of different programs, like sports programs, art programs, dance yeah. programs, equestrian, you know, and, and letting them experience all of these different things. And then whatever it is that my niece and nephew like, then, you know, continuing with that. Whereas my parents would put me into one thing and say, okay, you have to like this because right. again, it, it, and it's certainly a product of, of their resources, right? My parents didn't have the resources to put me into all of these different things. They only had the resources to put me into one thing. Um, and so growing up for me, when I was growing up, I only was exposed to a, a handful of different things like arts and sports right. and certain science groups and whatever would have you. Whereas now uh, and kids that are a product of my generation, again, so my generation being a little bit more affluent um, than my parents, we have the ability to put our kids into different things and have them experience different things. Furthermore, like buying them different things. Like I bought my nephew a, a, a telescope. I bought him a microscope wow. um, and he uses these things. But whether or not he chooses to use those things moving forward is certainly his choice. But he does have does now have this ability to experiment with the microscope, experiment with the telescope. So maybe he wants to be an astronomer. So for me, growing up, an astronomer was certainly not part of, of the options that I could have gone to. My parents certainly would not have been um, accommodating to me growing up and saying, hey, I want to be an astronomer. Right. Uh, but now with my generation, they would let their kids be an astronomer. Furthermore, because they are giving them these resources as they are growing up to identify, do you really like it? Is this a passion of yours? And if so, then you can then, then pursue it moving forward. No, I mean, and, and that's tough. And to be honest, I personally wrestle with that just because I do on. And again, I, I do on one, one hand understand the, the whole thought process of, hey, let your kid do a lot of different things or whatever they gra- gravitate towards or they have a passion for, you know, they'll select themselves. So having, you know, at some point or giving them a certain amount of autonomy, uh, autonomy to be able to kind of make the decision for themselves. On the other end, especially when you're talking about having a son, which uh, a lot of the times the man in society role is to provide uh, as well as protecting a number of, of other things when you're talking about having a nuclear family. Uh, but what if that, thing that they choose as their passion is a librarian or something that really doesn't pay, then it's like, okay, how do you reconcile that? Because, you know, like I said, it's, you want that level of independence. So they're not saying, Hey, mom or dad, can I have money to pay my bills and things like that? And, but at the same time, uh, you want, you want them to be in something that they're going to be able to make a good life for them, their family, uh, not only, you know, uh, now, but also, you know, for maybe them and their spouse as they you know, hit the retirement age. So how do you kind of reconcile that? Because that's something that I wrestle with uh, as I'm kind of thinking through this process. No, that's a great question. And, and one that, uh, to be honest with you, I have not thought about. Uh, but off the bat, and, and we'll use your librarian uh, example, if they wanted to be a librarian and do library studies, uh, then I certainly would not stop them. Um if that's their passion and if that's what they want to do, then then I would be completely 100 percent supportive of it. Uh, and, and just because had I done the science thing, like I'm really, really happy right now. I've completed all of my occupational goals. I'm at a really good stage in my life right now. I'm really happy with my work. Right. Um, it's not like you hear that cliche. If you don't like your work, then or, or, or if you like your work, then you'll never live a day or you'll never work a day in your life. Right. Um, so I, I, I think that that's certainly true. When I, I, I can certainly appreciate the fact that if you're if you are a librarian, then you may not be able to make as much as, let's say, an attorney. Uh, and so how do you reconcile that fact? Um I, I think that I mean so coming to the getting to the stage where you 
with resolution and with conviction you want to be a librarian. Um, I, I don't imagine that, you know, somebody wakes up or like a seven-year-old wants to be a librarian. It, it, it's certainly something that maybe when they mature a little bit more, um, then they realize that they want to be a librarian. So the, from my standpoint, in order to reconcile the fact that they may not be making as, a lot of money um, or as much money um, as, as, let's say, an attorney, that is when things like financial literacy as, as the child is growing up is really, really important. Um, for example, my 11-year-old nephew now just has just recently gotten a bank account with a debit card. Um, and, and his parents and myself, you know, we put money into, uh, into that account. And, and we, we, we let the, the nephew monitor his own money, spend his own money, however he sees fit. So I think building that, that strong foundation of financial literacy is really, really important. And if you do it properly, if you, if you instill the skills and the knowledge of investment, saving your money, parking money here, understanding inflation, um, then when they get to that point where they want to become a librarian, then they've already planned out, you know, how much money they're going to be making, the fact that they're comfortable making that much money and being a librarian, living within their means. Those are all things that 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 financial literacy, all those tools and, and lessons of financial literacy go into the equation of, of becoming a, a librarian. And right. so building that solid financial base of financial literacy. It doesn't even matter if it's a librarian, you could be a civil worker, you can be a, a dental hygienist, you could be whatever it is. But if you have those strong, if you have that strong knowledge foundation of financial literacy, then whatever it is that you want to do as your occupation moving forward, you will know how to operate within your means and how to extract as much benefit as you can from the money that you already have. Right. No, yeah, I, I definitely get that point. I, and, and again, it certainly helps that uh, financial literacy certainly helps when kind of understanding these decisions and not overspending and things like that. Uh, it's all, it just with the way society is constructed these days, especially here in the United States or kind of the Western world with uh, inflation and uh, things just kind of I mean, again, you're in Miami, you understand it. You, you know, you can easily pay two, three grand for just a regular apartment. And uh, when you're talking about making, say, 40 grand, $50,000 a year, it's almost like it's virtually impossible to, like, you know, when you're talking about paying rent and, you know, maybe a car and uh, utilities and, you know, groceries and things like that. Lord, you know, please don't have any kids. But I'm talking about, you know, for, your, for yourself, uh, it, it almost becomes, you know, you just literally run out of money when before you, you know, even start, you know, having the ability to invest. Uh, so I don't know. I, I I guess I'm not sure how I kind of feel about like that aspect of it uh, in terms of like, hey, you know, just teach them financial literacy and uh, regardless of what they do, whether they make $40,000 a year or $400,000 a year. So, I mean, certainly you're going to be able to get through it, uh, you know, whether or not you can say get it through it independent or not without maybe the state's help or family help and things like that. Uh, yeah, yeah, I guess I'm maybe not sure how that all plays out. Uh, well, we hear a lot of, uh, so now with uh, the proliferation of social media and the exchange and velocity of knowledge between people, there is this underlining narrative now that's percolating up to mainstream is, is teaching financial literacy in school. Uh, it, it's certainly like elementary school. Uh, rather than, I, I mean, the, the, the juxtaposition of that argument is like, why do we need to teach our kids pie? Um, they, we should be teaching them about, how, about, a, about a savings account and a bank account. And, and so I am certainly a, a believer of, of teaching kids financial literacy That's when so they're hard. small. Um, and, and it's not just teaching them, it's actually giving them money and, and i know that's probably a, a a foreign notion and maybe a little bit dangerous but but giving your your children money giving them a hundred dollars i mean what a hundred dollars to a five-year-old i mean not even a five-year-old a hundred dollars to an eight-year-old it, it seems like a hundred thousand dollars to them and, and so giving them a small amount of money giving them a debit card 
um, and teaching them about money and how to spend money, how to use a debit card. Because listen, I, I remember when I first got a debit card, I would use that on everything. I thought that I had unlimited amount of money when I had a debit card. And that's not even taking into consideration when I got my first credit card. And my first credit card had a $500 balance on it or had a $500 limit on it. But even still, I thought that I was the richest man in the world with a $500 credit card. But so teaching your kids about, about the credit and, and financial literacy and bank accounts and debit cards, teaching them young certainly will pay off um, uh, as they get older. Furthermore, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, teaching them skills. I mean, so when you have a hundred dollar, when you give them a hundred dollars, that opens up a myriad of different avenues where you can take financial literacy. You can then take them to, you know, how to buy things on sale um, or, you know, how to put away $5 a month into a savings account. And so these are all different uh, avenues, uh, different options uh, and different lessons of financial literacy that you could then branch off of just by giving them a bank account with a hundred dollars. No, and, and I, I think, again, I, I definitely think financial literacy is a big part of it. And I think it, I wholeheartedly agree with you as far as that should be taught in schools and uh, as a kid, or, or, you know, young as possible that to the fact that they can comprehend it. I, I, I just think that's half of the puzzle. I think uh, let them be able to balance a budget. So give them, a hundred grand a year uh, to play with, not not literally give them, but give them a scenario where they have a hundred grand a year and they have to make sense of that from a financial literacy standpoint and give them $40,000 a year from a budget standpoint and have them make sense of that. And I think they're going to uh, find that it's a lot more, it's a lot more uh, like satisfaction or a lot more, you can do a lot more with a hundred thousand dollars a year compared to having that $40,000 a year. Mm -hmm. And then I think being able to teach them, that from a, a, a you know a final financial literacy perspective, I think that will maybe open their eyes even more to so they're not just getting that financial financial literacy part of it in terms of saving, investing, and things like that, but also like man, I can make a hundred thousand dollars go a lot further and grow a lot mm -hmm. more uh, over time compared to uh, this other scenario. And uh, I, I, and and then I think the question becomes okay, how do I get the hundred thousand dollars a year, as opposed to how do I just get the forty thousand dollars? So I, mm -hmm. I agree with financial literacy and starting that young as possible, but I think again, I and again, this is kind of my belief. I, I just think that you know, just having forty thousand dollars or fifty thousand dollars a year, and I, I can be, it, it's almost like having Einstein and giving them limited equipment. That's mm -hmm. why I think the United States is such a superpower because we play with the high end toys, as opposed mm -hmm. to I, I think it's people just as smart in, in in other countries, but they're not playing with the type of toys that we, the high-end toys that we play with. And they're not, I mean, that 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 their money is limited based on, or their, uh, what, what they can make out of their situation is limited based on the money that they're given. Uh, and I think that's what kind of differentiates the U.S. from a lot of other countries. So I, I just think that financial literacy is important, but I also think that especially, maybe this is African-American community thing as well, where uh, a lot of the things that, you know, the horrible thing that I've seen over the years in the areas I grew up in, similar areas has come from a standpoint of a lack of money. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think if you give these same people, you know, forty thousand dollars or fifty thousand dollars a year, uh, whether or not they love their, you know, what they're doing or not, I just think that it almost not only doesn't solve things, uh, but it, it it almost doesn't want them to be better. I think that's why, you know, especially again in our in African American community, we look up to the entertainers and mm -hmm. athletes because they're playing with so much money and it seems like their life. At least on from the outside looking in is so great mm -hmm. that they can buy all these things. And obviously we know life is not just about material things and being able to buy stuff like that, but they're looking at something that uh it just seems uh at least exciting to them that you know have all this money or looking at other people with all this money and just being able to live this particular lifestyle. Uh so no, yeah, I mean that, that's interesting. I think that that's a uh, definitely an interesting take. Uh and I know we kind of went down a rabbit hole with that a little bit, but uh I thought that was good commentary. No, uh, absolutely. Uh, so so then kind of going into like, OK, law school and, you know, you talked about wanting to come to Michigan State University, but you're in Toronto at that point. So I guess what was the thought process behind, OK, going to the school in the United States as opposed to just kind of staying in Toronto, staying in Canada and going to a law school there? Because obviously, you know, for people who don't know, they do have law schools in Toronto and obviously they have a legal <laughs> system and judicial yeah. system and things like that. So uh, I was uh, I was on the waiting list to okay. go to University of Toronto. 
uh, law school, which is the number one law school in Canada and one of the top law schools in all of the world. Mind you, I was on the waiting list. Um, and so it would have been really easy. And I think I was like number four or five. So I would definitely okay. would have gone to University of oh. Toronto at that time. Um, but part of my calculation, and this goes back to what we were talking about before with our kids, I, I didn't, I wanted to do sports. Um, that is what I wanted to do. And so I was at the point in my life where I was, I was 30, uh, just graduated undergraduate, uh, just got my undergraduate degree, uh, with a bachelor of sports management and I wanted to do sports. And so I, I did the, the pros and cons, uh, uh, evaluation of going to university of Toronto or going to. Uh, a law school in the States. And so the law schools that, that I got accepted to in the States were Syracuse, Marquette, Tulane, uh, Michigan State. And you can see that all of those schools have either a really rich athletic program or have a really good sports law program. Uh, and so I, I was doing that balancing act. And I realized that if I were to go to University of Toronto, um, the, the, the opportunities to work in sports in Canada I mean, the Canadian sports culture is exponentially smaller than, than that of the United States. And so to go to the University of Toronto and then try to get into sports would have been maybe non-existent at the time, or the probability of that happening was, was really, really small. And and University of Toronto doesn't have a rich athletic program. And so it, it would have been really difficult for me to break into my passion. Whereas if I were to go to... Michigan State or Syracuse or Marquette or Tulane, the opportunity to get a law degree and work in sports was what was abundantly more apparent. Right. And so uh, I, I decided to go to Michigan State. The reason was that they had a fantastic athletic program at the time. I mean, my first year uh, at Michigan State, Michigan State football team went to the first ever college playoff. Yeah. Uh, we had Tom Izzo. You know, we got a rich athletic program there. Um, I got a hefty, I got a nice scholarship from Michigan State. My sister lived in Chicago or still lives in Chicago. My parents were in Toronto. So Michigan State, East Lansing was literally right smack dab in the yeah, middle sure. of both of them. And, and, and there's um, not to, to backtrack, but a lot of uh, parents, a lot of Indian parents at that time were trying to persuade their kids to go to school in the United States. Because oh, wow. The opportunities of more lucrative jobs was much more uh, abundant in the United States. For example, um, I, and, and I know what we're talking about, I was talking about sciences, but using, using lawyers as an example, a, a graduate in, in Toronto, a recent graduate from Toronto, we get a job articling in a law firm in downtown Toronto. Let's say it's one of the bigger law firms, you're only making like 80, 90,000 Canadian out of law school. Whereas when I came to Miami, um, the starting wages for an attorney right out of law school was 160,000 American. So the opportunity to make more money is certainly, uh, that, that opportunity is certainly in the United States rather than Canada. Um, so, you know, uh, there was also that as well. So had I gone to, or going to an American university, um, provided more opportunity to make that kind of money because I was here in the United States. Um, that being said, uh, the opportunity to go to Michigan State, I certainly didn't didn't plan and, and didn't want to, to stay in Michigan. And I love Michigan. It's my second yeah. home. Um, and East Lansing is like my second home. And so... But I didn't want to be in Michigan. And so going to Michigan State, the opportunity, it's not like University of Michigan, where, you know, you go to University of Michigan Law School, and then, you know, you can go to any big law firm, any big city in the United States. And so having wanting to differentiate myself um, in sports, I realized that I needed to go to a sports-centric school um, because I didn't want to just be, you know, doing – uh, law in, in Michigan. I wanted to go outside of Michigan. So I went yeah. to Michigan State to do sports and I wanted to translate sports into an opportunity to go somewhere else, maybe like New York or LA um, to do to do sports law and practice sports. No, yeah. And, and that's, you know, I think that's a good point. And that's, I think, uh, just you being intentional about, you know, the long term plans and just going to a place that you think that you that you felt that we're going to uh, give you the best chance long term to be successful 
wherever you ended up uh, in a field that you were interested in. So I, I guess you're going to Michigan State, and for those that don't know, Samir and I, we actually met in law school, and uh, and I always thought your 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 situation was interesting and always looked up to you uh, in many ways, and, and one of the ways was your ability to just network effectively in law school. And uh, so, so can you talk a little bit about that as far as, okay, how was law school for you? Uh, did you find it easy? Did you find it difficult? And then the importance of networking, because, uh, you know, a lot of the people that I kind of surround myself with to this day, I met in maybe engineering or law school. So how was that, uh, you know, did, did, was that something that you had on your mind going in in terms of, hey, man, I need to be able to network or is it just kind of, just kind of came, came to be uh and, and again, I, I think also if you can talk about a LinkedIn, because I think LinkedIn, man, I, I'm not, maybe it was around before, you know, we went to law school. It certainly seemed like, you know, it was, you know, Facebook, LinkedIn, it was all around that same time. And I remember, you know, in law school, we had to set up LinkedIn accounts and stuff like that. I'm like, I mean, what is this stuff? So as I was kind of going through law school, I really didn't uh, make it a point of kind of being on LinkedIn and networking, uh, using it as a networking tool to network effectively. But you... I thought, man, hey, if it was a master class on using LinkedIn, I thought that hey, you should be the teacher of it because the way you were able to use that tool of LinkedIn to try to uh, or to to put yourself in a position that you're in today and network and meet some great people and do some amazing things, I thought that you played that perfectly. So can you kind of, I know I threw a lot at you, but can you talk about those different things as far as networking and LinkedIn and, and, and just kind of going through law school? So, so first with law school, um, yeah, when you go to law school, before your first day, you have uh, you have ideas that you're going to be it's going to be hard. It's going to be a lot of work, uh, which it certainly is. Um, but it's not hard. In my opinion, I didn't think law school was actually that hard. Same here. I same. And maybe that for me it was because of engineering, but I thought law school was you know pretty straightforward. Yeah. So it's a lot of work. Uh, that's for sure, because you don't want to be one of those students who goes to class, gets called on, and then you're not you're not prepared. Yeah. Um, it, there, there's a myriad of reasons why. One, because you don't look good to your classmates. Two, you don't want to get a bad grade. Three, you want to make a good impression on, on your professors, because and one of the first lessons that they give you in law school is, is this is where your networking begins. It begins in law school with your peers because as you grow older, you may get business for them or they may come to you for, for some kind of legal expertise and your, and your law professors are those that are writing reference letters for you. Sometimes, I mean, a lot of times your law professors go to or, or went to, you know, really, really good law schools. So their colleagues are still working in private practice as a general counselor in a law firm. So you never know when you can get a referral from your law professors. And I know you and I did a lot of work, you know, trying to forge relationships with our law professors. Um, but law school in and of itself, at least for me, wasn't very difficult. The subject matter wasn't very difficult. It was really, really dry. So trying to maintain your, your motivation, your enthusiasm and your interest in the material is difficult. But it's just a route routine of going to class, going home, reading 50 pages, making notes of the cases that you read, and you're just doing that over and over and over again for three years. So law school in and of itself wasn't very difficult. Uh, and just to add to that, I mean, the bar exam certainly wasn't very difficult as well. So for those, um, I, I, I'll leave it at that. But, but law school and the bar exam weren't very difficult. Um, as far as networking is concerned, uh, I've always been really, I mean, I, at least I like to think of myself as somebody who's easy to talk to. Right. Um, I always like meeting new people. Um, I like talking about things that I'm passionate about. Uh, and, and so uh, using LinkedIn uh, and Twitter um, was in finding like-minded individuals on those, on those platforms and talking about the issues that are really important and passionate between the both of us, it makes it easy. Uh, it's it certainly, I, one of the things that I would recommend is don't go on LinkedIn or, or Twitter and try to create an image of yourself that's not actually you. All right. Be um, 
use those tools to express yourself and your passion and your interest. Because there are certainly people that are on LinkedIn and Twitter that are doing that as well. They're trying to find like-minded individuals. They're not trying to create themselves out to be something that they're not. Furthermore, if you create yourself out to be something that you're not, then you're going to go down that rabbit hole. And five years later, you're going to find yourself doing work that you don't really want to do. For example, I mean, there are there are attorneys um, and law students that that we know of um, that and our, our classmates that wanted to do like environmental law or wanted to do you know animal rights law or wanted to work with you know underprivileged people in society. And then they create this LinkedIn profile because they want to get a nice, they want to get a good clerkship with a good judge, or they want to get a good summer internship with a certain law firm. And then they create this persona of, of being like a corporate attorney and, 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 you know, tweeting or making posts about things in the law that they're really not passionate about. But then they get the summer internship and then they're stuck, you know, with this, with this corporate partner and they're going to be working with that partner for the summer and then you just can't shake that after the fact because on your resume you're going to say that you know you did corporate work when in your 1L year or you clerked with this judge who does like pre predominant bankruptcy law or, or whatever what have you and so then you're stuck doing that so those ambitions of being an environmental lawyer is literally thrown out the window because now you can't you're no longer an environmental lawyer you're 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 like an administrative lawyer you're a corporate lawyer so if you're going to use social media, articulate who you are. Don't try to fake it. And I know that like in the law, in the legal industry, faking until you're making fake it until you make it is a big thing. Um, but I mean, case in point, you and I are perfect examples where you don't need to fake it. Just be yourself, do it, yeah. do it, follow your passion. And then, you know, my one of my mottos is if you put good energy into the universe, the universe will reward you back. So so just put that, use your social media and your Twitter as an extension of yourself. Um, and, and don't try to, don't fake yourself. No, uh, I think that's important. And I mean, I, I mean, a lot of times when I'm doing these interviews, I'm not just doing it so that the audience can get, you know, skills and jewels out of it or uh, nuggets and jewels out of it. But I think uh, I, when I try to learn some, something from each interview and I, and I, I think, you know, what you just said kind of has some light bulbs go off for me because you know, I'm on Facebook. I'm kind of trying to do a little bit more on Instagram. And from that perspective, I'm from those like Facebook and Instagram, I can I feel like I'm a little bit more myself when I get to talk about real estate and I get to talk about sports and the things that I'm doing with the law and stuff like that. And it feels more authentic. I never even though I'm on LinkedIn and I you know accept people and uh, message people back and forth from time to time. I'm not as active on LinkedIn just because I haven't kind of felt how to use it uh, in a way that feels authentic to me. And I think that's uh, or right for me, I should say. And I think what you just said, answer my question as far as, or provided some uh, recommendations to that as far as just be authentic. So if that means talking about sports and your love for sports and hopefully trying to kind of put it in a context that people can understand, maybe from a legal standpoint or whatever the case may be, or even uh, like I said, I'm a big real estate guy. I, I, just trying to go about you know making posts and using that platform specifically LinkedIn in a way that is authentic for me and I'm not trying to uh be someone who I'm actually not in real life because that's something that I try to stay away from and that's why I haven't been as active on it because it was like ah how do I use this thing in a way that still feels authentic to me and I just wasn't able to uh kind of figure it out but I think I have some ideas based on what you just said so I, I appreciate you saying that yeah I mean a lot of a lot of attorneys like Nobody goes to law school wanting to be a data privacy attorney. Nobody goes to law school wanting to do, you know, hammer out easements, you know, in small town Michigan. You don't do that. You, but the way that that comes about is you pigeon yourself, you pigeonhole yourself into those kinds of jobs. And you just can't, I mean, the shackles are on at that point in time. You've promoted yourself as, as that kind of attorney. You just can't break away from it at that point in time. So uh, for law students that are wanting to go to law school or, or, or potential law students, don't pigeonhole yourself. Don't just try to find the quickest, easiest way to add something to your resume. Pursue things that you want to pursue in the future. Because listen, once you're done, you're going to be 24 years old and your first job out of law school, you're going to be sitting in your office for 80 hours a week just doing document review. And, and, and there's, there, you won't have the opportunity to express your creativity um, during the first three, four years of your career as an attorney. And so 
make sure that, you know, that grunt work that you're doing, those 80 hours a week that you're doing your first four years are to, are in a, a genre of law that, that is that you want to do for the rest of your life. Right, right. And I, and I think that applies for not even just law students, but whoever it is, whether yeah, you're an engineer, absolutely. whether you are, uh, uh, you know, somewhere in the entertainment industry, you know, about kind of doing things that kind of speak to you and that is authentic to you as opposed to being pigeonholed by the circumstances or just kind of about w w whatever comes up or just not being intentional. So I think that can apply to mm -hmm. uh, a host of different things, uh, not only just, you know, the legal legal profession. So so how, how did you... Uh, Again, because you no know, went to Michigan State. Now you're at Holiday Night, as you mentioned earlier, and that's man, that's a, a well-known law firm. So, can you talk about from a networking perspective how you was able to kind of navigate? Uh, I don't want to say navigate, but land that position coming from Michigan State was networking important for that? Did you were you able to kind of connect the dots and just kind of network and meet some people who know some people to be able to land that job, or was it just hey, I'm applied to, to Holiday Night after law school and. Uh, they accepted me or they interviewed me and they gave me an offer based on that. So how was that? Because, uh, you know, Holly and the night, like you said, you live a good life and they are paying big law firm price, a big law firm. So they're paying big law firm prices. So I was going from Michigan State to law school. And how did I mean, Michigan State to Holly and the night? And how did that all come about? So uh, at Michigan State, again, so I'll just reiterate that I wanted to become a sports agent. Yeah. Um, and so uh, when I was at Michigan State, um, one of our professors, his name was Daniel Barnheiser, Professor Barnheiser, Smart. Um, uh, introduced me to another professor who was, his name was Professor Daniel Katz, he's now at Northwestern, um, but he created something called the reInvent Law Program. And it, and the, it was a student organization uh, focused on integrating technology in, into legal practice. And I thought that this was a really good way to differentiate myself because Eventually, I wanted to be, uh, I mean, I wanted to be a sports agent, but the end goal was to be a general manager. Uh, and so uh, I was of a professional sports team. And so my, the way that I kind of process mapped that out was I was going to go to law school. Um, in law school, I, I would have created this brand and then I would latch on with a sports team and work in the legal department of a sports team. Um, and then from there, try to latch on to the player development side of the team and then work my way up to the player development side and, and, and get into the front office. And so I, I, I realized that uh, having into being introduced to Daniel Katz and this legal technology, that one of the things that I could do, sorry, it's just looking like I'm going into heaven right now. Um, uh, one of the things that I realized was general counsel's offices uh, of sports teams act a lot like general counsel offices of any different business organization. So, the opportunity to inject technology into the daily operations of a general counsel's office of the sports team may be a competitive advantage because at that time I was unaware uh, of sports teams using things like document automation and machine learning and Lean Six Sigma in, in their practices and decreasing the operating costs uh, of the general counsel's office of a sports team. So. Uh, I learned about legal technology and through one of these um, uh, boot camps, which is a weekend kind of uh, uh, educational program um, regarding legal technology, I learned about Twitter and LinkedIn and how to use Twitter uh, to create a brand of yourself. And so I created a Twitter pro, uh, profile and started tweeting about sports and, and the different things uh, 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 regarding sports and business. Um, so I had that on the side. And then as well, I learned of a program called Law Without Walls, which is based out of the University of Miami. And it was an international student program where students from all around the world, um, from like really, really good universities and law schools, would come together. About 50 of the top uh, law students from around the world would get together. They get split up to teams. And then you solve a, a, a problem that, that you know, the, the, the program would provide you. Uh, and so I was part of Law Without Walls, and so I was working with students from Spain and, and Romania uh, and in Chicago, and we were all part of the same team. And, and so I went through that Law Without Walls program. And, and, and the thing with Law Without Walls is every Wednesday you would have a mandatory webinar. And, and so you, I would watch these webinars on different aspects uh, of the legal industry. And one of the webinars was on blockchain technology. And so to go back to LinkedIn, or sorry, go back to Twitter, um, through, you know, tweeting about sports and the business of sports, I came and, 
and sports is certainly predicated on contracts. Um, everything in the sports world is a contract. And so um, going through Twitter, I found the hashtag smart contract. And so I was like, okay, what's a smart contract? And so I started reading about smart contracts and then that led me to blockchain technology. And I was reading up on blockchain technology and I realized, wow, this is going to be the financial infrastructure of the future. And at that point in time, there were only a handful of people uh, of, on Twitter that were tweeting about the legal implications on blockchain technology and I being one of them. Furthermore, I was probably the only law student at the time talking about blockchain technology and the law. And so through my Twitter uh, activity, I started talking to a lot of really, really big time lawyers in the space, DMing these lawyers uh, uh, and talking about the legal implications of blockchain technology. And I, I met this one person um, I didn't know who that person was at the time, but their, their Twitter handle was contract code. And so me and this person would, we were talking for like a year about blockchain technology and the law. And I, again, I had no idea who this person was. So going back to law with the walls, one of the webinars was on blockchain technology. So I decided to research the presenters. And one of the presenters was a gentleman by the name of Josiah Dewey. And so I did a little bit of research on Josiah Dewey, realized that he had a Twitter handle um, found out that his Twitter handle was contract code. And I was like, oh, wow. Well, I've been talking to this person for like a year. Right. Um, and I didn't know who this person was, but now I know who this person was. And it was around the time of me sending out resumes and, to different law firms. And I, I, you and I went to Michigan State. And, and so when I would send a resume out to DLA Piper, or Jones Day, or, or Latham and Watkins, Kirkland and Ellis. Uh, I was literally just throwing a resume to the wind, not expecting them to reach back out to me because these are law firms that hire the top 10% of Harvard grads, yeah. Yale, University world of World leaders. These are world leader law firms. Yeah. And so, but they ended up calling me back and they ended up responding to me because I had this blockchain technology expertise uh, and there wasn't any law students at the time anywhere in the world that, you know, was an expert in blockchain technology and the law. So I had all of these top 50 law firms emailing me back, wanting to set up interviews. And so I found out, and this is at the same time I found out who contract code was, was just size Dewey here at all in a night, which again is one of these big time law firms. So I sent him a DM message and I said, hey, uh, uh, I'm part of Law Without Walls. I'm going to be in this webinar um, that, that you're going to be presenting on on, on Wednesday. Uh, I have all of these, these interviews lined up. It, can I pick your brain on, you know, what I should say during an interview, um, how I should go about these interviews? And he responds back to me. He's like, hey, have an interview with me tomorrow um, and I'll tell you all the tricks of the trade. And so the next day, uh, I had an hour and a half conversation with Joe Dewey on the phone at Michigan State College of Law campus. And at the end of that conversation, he said, give me two weeks. Uh, I'll send you an offer letter. Come work with me in Miami at Hall on a night. And I remember, I mean, I called you right after. Yeah, and, yeah, I said, sure. and I said, man, you know, things are going down. And then two weeks later, you know, I get this, I get this contract, um, DHL, and, and, and then uh, everything came from there. But it was certainly serendipitous, which is what networking is all about. You never go, when, when it comes to networking, you can never talk to somebody or never go into, never go into a networking event saying, you know what, I will really, really, really need to talk to this person. Or, or you know what, this person they're not wearing a suit. So I'm not going to talk to that person or this person is just slamming back old fashions at the bar. So I don't want to talk to that person. You should go into networking, just wanting to talk to anybody and everybody that you can at least say hi, explain to them who you are because you never mm -hmm. know their position, their life story and never judge a book by the recovery. Always just talk to anybody and everybody because that would, that's what networking is all about. You never know the gold mine that is on the other end of that person. And you never know, like, you may meet, like, a lifelong friend. And then, you, add, you know, right. you guys are friends. And then at, during your friendship, you know, opportunities will come up. I mean, obviously, you know, being friend is, is the most rewarding thing of it. But I had, you know, talking to contract code 
for a year, not knowing who that person was, didn't know that they had the hiring power that they did. Had I known that, maybe I would have been less authentic, right? Maybe right. I would have tried to present like, maybe I would have been more cordial and more stern and more, you know, stuck up and narrow minded. Um, but instead, I was authentic. And that goes again, and that goes again to reiterate, you know, if you're going to be using social media, be authentic, be yourself. And especially when networking, be authentic, be yourself, because you never know who's on the other end uh, of those conversations. And it was just so serendipitous that I used Twitter. I used Twitter to create a brand. And then the ideal story came through where I was able to secure uh, a job through through Twitter. No, yeah. And I uh, man, I, I agree with that wholeheartedly and not, not even just from I just think just that's how people maybe should leave, uh, live them li live, live yeah. their lives as far as just, hey, uh, not going into it. Uh, uh, a lot of times when you know who someone is, then you already are not going to be authentic because you feel like you have to put on a, you know, this whole appearance to try to, you know, make yourself look better than maybe what you are or try to have the other person be impressed with, you know, who you are, where like you said, you, you being able to be authentic, it kind of worked out for you. And I, I think I had a similar story where, uh, you know, when I was doing a, a internship at, uh, uh, you no know, Ford Motor Company. I was uh, just interested in this particular person who was in house. He was a patent attorney in house at Ford, and we had a lot of similar. Uh, we had our background was very similar, and you know he ended up winding uh, winding up being a VP and you know head of IP at a, at a, at a, like a billion dollar company. And you know he was like, hey, I, you know, I want to work with you. And all of a sudden, as a as a as a uh, uh, attorney, I'm. I'm managing a client that is a billion dollar client. And, and again, I wasn't going in looking for anything. I was just being myself curious of his, how he kind of, kind of doing, did the things he did, or at least got in that position that he was in. And, and again, it, that was that initial meeting with me and this gentleman was 10 years before, uh, you know, we started working together. So it, it may not be today. It may not be tomorrow, but you never know what comes uh, from that meeting and you never, cause you never know in part what that per where, where that person was going to end up. You may be talking to somebody who's relatively unknown today, but he may turn out to be Elon Musk or turn out to be a Jeff Bezos and he or she will remember that conversation or that interaction, especially if you're being genuine and uh, that can lead to something. So, I mean, I definitely agree with everything you just said with that. Uh, I do want to kind of transition cause now, you have the job at Holland at night and now you're, you know, you talked about making money and what they're paying first year associates. And again, that was what five, six years ago or whatnot. So, and, and now you're in Miami. Uh, and so how, how do you go about, or did you have this thought process of, okay, uh, what you grew up with your parents saving and, and put money away? Or at this point in time, did you start to adopt this new philosophy of, Hey, you know, I, I need to, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do the same thing that my parents all, always talked about with mutual funds and things like that. But being a little bit younger and coming into the money that I'm coming into, I am, uh, uh, I'm open to a little bit more riskier investments at this point in time. So ultimately, how did you decide what was your investment vehicles go vehicle was going to be? And, uh, uh how did you kind of, kind of, navigate that process of investing and not just kind of saving money and, uh, you know, putting money into a bank savings account or putting money under your bed or whatever, but really investing to try to get ahead. Yeah. So when I first, I mean, I'll, I'll be first to admit as well. I, I, I didn't know much about, about investing, uh, even after law school. So like I never had, I, I never looked at investment cause I never had a lot of money. So no. like any money that I had, I would just spend on, on extracurricular activities. So I never had, I never thought about investing or anything of that nature, but it, what, what it, the the light really clicked on for me when uh, it was during my first week here at Hall on a Night. And the one of the good things about working at a big law firm is they they provide you all the resources that you need in order to um, be successful in, in life and your career. So they had a financial advisor um, do a, a seminar for one of uh, for all of the first year associates. Uh, here in Holland at night uh, in the Miami office, there's only five of us. Uh, so there were five of us and there was this financial investor or financial advisor, sorry. And so it was a really intimate conversation uh, about investing. And it wasn't certain, it, it certainly wasn't, I mean, so that person was from Fidelity. Fidelity handles the 401k for, for Holland and Knight. Oh. Um, uh, but it wasn't necessarily kind, it wasn't like they weren't pressuring us to invest with Fidelity, um, even though, you know, we only had the one 401k option. 
Um, so it was a really um, organic conversation. But one of the first thing that that person said was, you guys are going to, you guys are going to be millionaires. Uh, you know, you're, you're going to work here and they're a hundred percent, unless you leave early um, or you get fired or whatever, you're going to be a millionaire. And so the way you got to protect your, your income and you got to protect um, your money and make sure you don't lose it. Um, and so that's when, you know, it really clicked on me where, so like the, the idea of a 401k, I mean, I'm a Canadian, so I didn't know anything about a 401k and, and, and they said, listen, if you put, you max out your 401k you're you're not even going to th- you're not even going to think about it but like once you retire you're going to have you know seven figures in a 401k account if you're going to work 20 years you max out your 401k for 20 years you're going to be you're going to be good for retirement so, and, and again and sorry to cut you off but and that's another one of those things because a lot of times these days people are you know if you can put 20,500 which is considered you know the maximum contribution uh, a lot of people, you just don't have that money. So for the Liberian, going back to that example, who's making forty thousand dollars a year, they, they may be putting five thousand dollars in. So that's when I kind of talk about not being able to. You almost don't have the, the the funds to invest after you get done, you know, paying everything that you have to pay to live over the course of a year to invest in things, whether it's you know in a four hundred one k, much less any other uh, investment vehicles. But I, I mean, I think you said another word in terms of maxing out that. 401k with which is almost I've been doing that for the past couple of years and that's something that I've been trying to continue to do uh because like you said if you just do that alone you're going to be so much better off when it's time 20 30 years later when you you're at retirement but a lot of people uh believe it or not they, they're not putting anything close to that maximum contribution these a lot of people are maybe putting a couple thousand dollars a year five six thousand dollars a year if you're lucky I, I think you should at least be doing the uh the point where you can get the maximum uh, contribution from your employer, even if it's not your maximum contribution, that being a twenty thousand five hundred. But I don't know. I, I just thought I mentioned that because. Uh, uh, no, you're 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 right. Listen, twenty thousand five hundred dollars is a lot of money. Um, but that alone, if you did nothing else and just did that, like the gentleman said, you will, you will have million dollars in this thing. Yeah. Uh, so I, I mean, I think about that, and I think about the person who. Uh, you know, has for is making forty thousand dollars or making fifty thousand dollars. Like, oh no, just just at least get to seventy, eighty thousand dollars. Because even if you know that, that affords you to be able to put the twenty thousand dollars away, if you don't do anything else, you're going to be a lot better off when it comes to retirement as opposed to uh, you know, put in you no know, only two thousand dollars, three thousand dollars in there. And okay, you kind of live this life full of passion. Uh, with you no. Know, I don't want to continue to pick on the librarians, but uh, <laughs> uh, you you live this life, this fulfilled life. But now you're at retirement, and you're like, man, okay, what, what do we think rent is going to be in you no know, twenty, what, forty or twenty sixty? I mean, it could very well be four or five thousand dollars. Not to mention other, uh, the other stuff with vehicles and food and all that stuff with inflation. So I guess that's something that I think about when I try to take this long term approach. But uh. uh I apologize for uh, that, that. That no, that, no, uh, that's, that's good stuff. I mean, when I, and you're right. Yeah, so transferring money from your daily routine to our 401k is it, it is quite the cha- the chasm, quite the paradigm shift. Yeah. Uh, that being said, um, one of the easiest things to do is to just set up automatic deductions um, because you don't even see it, right? It's yeah. not even. Uh, it, it, in essence, you, the, the notion or the, the visualization of money getting taken out of your account and put into something else it, it is not there because it's automatically been done. And so one of the things that I would that I would say is even if you're making fifty thousand dollars a year and, and every check of yours, you know, after taxes is five hundred dollars, putting away 20 bucks. You know, just automatically deducting twenty dollars into a four hundred one k. I mean, it just adds up in the aggregate. It certainly adds up. Um, and so, automatic deductions is one of those things that make investing a lot more palpable because you're not necessarily taking money out of your account and transferring over somewhere else. Because that kind, that mechanism, that 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 visualization is 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 a little bit harder to digest when when you had the twenty dollars in your hand right here you'd be like hey I can go out and do this and dropping it there that 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 notion of taking that twenty dollars and no longer and dropping it somewhere is really really hard when you get that check for four hundred and eighty dollars after and then say okay this I can do whatever it is that I want with this four hundred and eighty bucks 
So, so the 401k and the automatic deductions is certainly um, the first step. And, and I'll, and I'll tell you another story. So, so I, I did the 401k talking with the fidelity invest uh, advisor. Um, and then I talked to my boss, Josiah Stewie, who, and he, he said, you should really get a financial advisor and start diversifying your funds. And the rule of thumb is you have 30% of your total assets in cash. And then the remaining 70% should be in investment vehicles. Um, and so I, I was, you know, my first, second, third year here at Holland and Knight, I certainly had more cash than I needed. Um, and I was talking to my boss about it. And this is after, you know, the automatic deductions. I was talking to my boss about it. And so he said, let me introduce you to my financial advisor, a gentleman over at Raymond James. Um, and so I started talking to this guy uh, and he ended up becoming my financial advisor. And a financial advisor is actually a great thing um, for people to have. It, it may not be a good thing for, for those that are, it, it's, it's not for everybody. Uh, and the reason why is because and using this last couple of years, as for example, um, I invested money with my financial advisor. Um, the financial advisor diversifies those funds, uh, you know, and things like the S and P and the Nasdaq. And as uh, as the the S and P goes down, my investment total allocation goes down. So I'm losing money, and I'm still paying my financial advisor one percent. So you know, you're 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 losing money in two different directions. But the thing is with the financial advisor and investing in a mutual fund or investing money with the financial advisor, again, those because that money is getting automatically deducted out of my bank account. It's going towards a financial advisor. They're putting it into vehicles like the S&P 500 or whatever, what have you. And if there's one thing that we know about the stock market is that it always goes up. Right. So like we're going to have a two year swan. I remember during COVID. Um, uh, the, the peak of the S and P 500 was at like 4,600 points. My investment at that point in time, I was making five figures or I had five figure profit off of my investment. And then the stock market went all the way down to 36, 3,500 points. I mean, and now I'm down in the hole 15 grand and, and everybody's like, Oh, there's going to be a recession or uh, this uh, is going to be a great depression. And the stock market is going to collapse. And now we're seeing the S&P back at like 3,900, hovering around 4,000 points. And this is like on the recovery end. So this is not even like another bull market. So like another bull market would see the S&P 500 hit 5,000 points. And then there'll be a recession from 5,000 down to 4,300. And then it'll go up again, you know? So like the stock market always goes up. And the one thing that I could say when it comes to investing in financial vehicles is that Unless you're a day trader, um, you know, just just put it in there and don't even think about it. So one rule is only put in the amount of money that that won't affect your life. If you find yourself, you know, at the end of every month and you have a surplus of four hundred dollars in your bank account and you're saving four hundred dollars, and maybe your goal is to save four hundred dollars, take a hundred of that four hundred and put it in an investment vehicle and just don't think about it. Because now you're going, to, so you're, you're going to be training your mind to now just think, have I saved $300 every month? Mm -hmm. Knowing that you have a, a $100 automatically deducted to this investment vehicle. And so it was certainly, for me, it was a process. And like, you're not going to become Gordon Gecko uh, in, in like a month. Uh, your, your investment vehicles, and this goes back to what you were talking about, which I, I'm going to use a lot moving forward is competency leads to comp leads to compensation. Mm -hmm. So the more you educate yourself about different financial vehicles, different savings accounts, um, the, the more confident you're going to be in, in saving and allocating your, your funds. So, so, and, and we talked about, I guess just kind of end things off here. I know we talked a lot about uh, you, you know, or uh, you, know, you doing blockchain and kind of that's that the space that you're in. Uh, so outside of maybe your what I would call it safer uh, investment vehicle, that being, you know, stocks and things like that, because, you know, over the long haul, that's going to go up, uh, continue to trend upwardly. Uh, do you do uh, other things uh, that's maybe a little bit more risky or given the fact that, you know, you're still relatively young and uh, are making a, a decent amount? Do you do other things uh, around that kind of blockchain space 
uh, any any of those type of investment. I know, uh, again, I'm, I'm, I'm a big real estate guy, and uh, I obviously do the 401k just from the uh, – just with, uh, through my employer, and uh, I do have a brokerage account and, and, and things like that. Uh, but I'm not maybe a big, say, crypto guy or – uh, I wouldn't even call myself a big stock guy, even though you know I have those I have money in the in, in the market. Uh, and, you know, I think what is it uh, FTX? Which I what is that? Uh, uh, what what is that uh, FTX stands for? Uh, uh, the, the acronym for FTX is is, is uh, I don't think anybody knows what that acronym is. Okay, but when you see that kind of crash, and it seems like that was a lot. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, I'm unable to talk about FTX. Okay, okay. Uh, okay. Um, no, I understand that. But well, so kind of going back to the whole kind of the blockchain thing and and, and investments outside of the four hundred one k. Do you kind of see yourself investing in that space as well, or being an investor in that space, or is it just kind of kind of sticking with the stock market and uh, that's it? Yeah, no, certainly. So uh, first off, none of this is financial advice. Right. No. Uh, yeah, for sure. And I always like to you know preface that. I, I think that's a yeah. good point. I remember saying that on a, a last interview. Hey, none of this is financial advice. This is kind of what uh no his particular situation is and that can be uh based on a number of different things that uh kind of just fits what he's looking for and things like that so don't take this and try to mimic exactly what it is that, he, that he's doing uh this is just kind of how he's doing things which is you know specific and particular to him so so it's certainly so my foray into blockchain technology started when i was in law school um uh, and it, again it goes back to a competency at least the compensation so um, I, w- I would say that the blockchain space and, and, and cryptocurrencies um, is certainly not for the faint at heart. Uh, it, it, it definitely requires um, some kind of technological um, uh, savvy. Uh, reason being is blockchain technology is, is really complex. Um, it's certainly not anything close to like Windows or, or your iPhone or, or Excel. Um, it's certainly really, 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 really more complicated than that. Uh, and, and when making investments into cryptocurrency, so one of the notions of cryptocurrency and blockchain technology is that it's open source. So when you hear a company uh, or, or an entity or a protocol say that we have this token and we have this platform that's going to do x y and z most of the time if they're following the blockchain ethos then all of that computer coding would be open source so you can go on github and you can examine the source code and you can see right there and then that if what that company or protocol is professing to be true is actually true because yeah. you're looking at the computer code and if their computer code uh, and if their, their, their technological stack is not open source, then they're not following the blockchain ethos. So that right there gives you a red flag. So, so open source just means that it can be, you know, whoever, just anyone can actually go in and see what's going on in terms of the code and whether it's what they, the, the, the uh, I guess. Yeah. The, okay. Yeah. And, and, and so there's that. And furthermore, open source, if it's truly open source, somebody should be able to copy and paste the code and deploy it themselves as right. well to make it duplicable. Maybe they change something. I mean, that's how a lot of, of blockchain started, where you had the open source code of Bitcoin and then Ethereum came along and they okay. used the aspects of Bitcoin to create Ethereum. And then Ethereum uh, created new features or or abilities on top of blockchain, um, and then that's all open source. And a lot of these tokens that are on the Ethereum blockchain took the open source coding from Ethereum, changed a little bit, de- redeployed it, and created their own cryptocurrency uh, on, on the Ethereum blockchain or whatever. So it's a lot of open source coding. It's a lot of auditing. Um, and it's a lot of technological know-how. So for those that that want to invest into cryptocurrencies, it, by just going on Twitter and, and reading the marketing uh, of different protocols, you're you potentially could be setting yourself up for failure. I mean, FTX um, is a perfect example. There are there are tokens that are out there that have, and you, you'll hear things like decentralized finance. And there's a lot of these protocols that say 
buy this token, invest it into us, and you get 20% um, interest at the end of the year. And so one of those is, is, a, is a token called Terra Luna. Uh, and Terra was its own blockchain. And Luna was the cryptocurrency associated with the blockchain. And you can take your Luna and you can exchange it for, let's say the, the, the token Luna was at $50. You can take that token, exchange it for stable coins, which is supposed to be one to one backed by the dollar, the US dollar. So you take that stable coin, it's called, uh, the, I think they were called um, UST, so the UST, US Terras. You take those, those Terras, you invest it into an application called Anchor Protocol, and you take the, you would get 20% off of those stable coins. You get 20% interest. And then Terra Luna collapsed. So there's billions of dollars that collapsed. And a lot of people invested into it because they saw, you know, 20% APR and they were like, oh, okay, well, th th I want 20%. And then it, it all crashed. And a lot of people, a lot of main street people lost all of their money, all of, the, all of their life savings. And it's because they didn't do the due diligence. Right, right. Uh, and, so, Go ahead. and so with cryptocurrencies, it's, it's really difficult for main street investors that don't have any uh, technological know-how um, to invest with confidence in blockchain technology because they are not the ones <coughs> auditing. They're just going off of marketing and whatever what have you. So I would say that if you are going to invest in cryptocurrencies, <coughs> please, please, please ensure that you're only investing the amount of money that, that you can lose. Uh, and don't put all of your life savings into it. Um, uh, and same thing goes with NFTs as well. Uh, don't invest a significant portion of your of your financial well-being into these kinds of, of applications and asset classes unless you know the code, unless you want to learn about the code, um, and unless you're you could afford to lose everything that you have. Right. No, I still invest in it. And obviously, no investment is guaranteed. There's risk associated with a lot of it. Uh, obviously, a big part of investing is understanding those risks. And that's, you know, based on knowledge, that's why I'm a big proponent of real estate, just because I understand the risk. I can look at a deal, look at the numbers and see if it makes sense, look at the area, all those things. And I think what you're saying is similar with crypto and blockchain is, hey, you know, the, the open source code being almost, you know, almost like a need to know and uh, not just kind of going with the flow, because it seems like that's what you, lot of, you see a lot of with, OK, they get these entertainers and athletes to try to endorse something. You know, I mean, I like this person or LeBron James or Stephen Curry. And it seems like he did a commercial uh, giving us a thumbs up. So I'm going to do it. And, and you know, that's a whole nother story in, front, in terms of them people get, getting paid uh, for actually promoting a product. And uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure those you know, people getting pay, paid for promoting a product has have little to no understanding of how this stuff works. And they're, you know, kind of getting people who kind of follow them to kind of invest. Yeah, so one, in, one, more, one great example of that is Kim Kardashian. So, Kim Kardashian promoted a cryptocurrency last year. Uh, the cryptocurrency ended up being a Ponzi scheme. Yep. And yeah. the Securities Exchange Commission fined Kim Kardashian $1.5 million for promoting this Ponzi scheme. Yep. So you're absolutely right. A lot of these celebrities are promoting these cryptocurrencies, not knowing the danger that they're putting right. your followers into. So if you if there is a, a, one of your favorite celebrities that are promoting a cryptocurrency that still doesn't give you you know the justification that you, that you need in order to invest because for for you to lose your life savings is a is a really big thing but for Kim Kardashian to pay a 1.5 million dollar fine mm -hmm. is is not even the sweat off of her back and, and again not only that but she is making money for promoting it. She probably yeah. doesn't even, she's probably not even investing her money into it. Or, yeah. you know, if she is investing her money, it'll be probably the money that she's making for promoting a product. So yeah, she, she probably made more than 1.5. They probably paid her five, yeah. more than $1.5 yeah. million yeah. to promote it. For sure. For sure. So That's even true. after the fine, she's probably walking away still in the black. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, no, I mean, and I can talk about that stuff all day. Like I said, I'm not you know, necessarily a, a crypto or blockchain person, but just to kind of just from an investment standpoint, because that seems to be the new buzzword, crypto and blockchain and this coin and that coin and this token and that token. Just really 
understand what it is that you're getting yourself into. It seems like, hey, look at the open source code. Make sure you understand what's going on and don't put your life savings or an amount that you won't be able to lose at all and still kind of be able to go about your day uh, relatively unscathed. So, I mean, I, I think that's great. Uh, I think that's a uh, great another, information. That's a great take on uh, things. Go ahead. Another important thing for people that want to invest into cryptocurrencies is the notion um, not your keys, not your coin. So, the way that the, the the way that that works is by by being a blockchain purist like myself and a lot of other blockchain people from around the world I and mean, millions. The way that you buy cryptocurrency is you'll buy it um, from uh, an exchange, whether that be a decentralized exchange like Uniswap. And what that what a decentralized exchange means, uh, in essence, is that it's not a centrally run exchange. There's not one legal entity that runs the exchange like Coinbase. That's an example of a centralized exchange a decentralized exchange like uniswap is just a technology stack that exists on the blockchain that allows people to exchange with each other so a bunch of people created the technology deployed it on the blockchain and then it just rests there without any human intervention it just operates on its own without any human being whatsoever that's a decentralized exchange and an, ex an example of that is uniswap and then you have centralized exchanges like coinbase um where if you were to buy uh, a, a bitcoin on coinbase that that bitcoin is not in your wallet it, 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 it you still don't have 100 percent control over it it rests in a wallet uh with coinbase so if you wanted to take that bitcoin and give it to somebody else you need to go through coinbase first and that goes against the peer-to-peer -peer blockchain ethos where blockchain is supposed to be, I have my Bitcoin in my wallet. And if I wanted to give it to you, I could send it directly to you without having to talk to anybody else. Right. That's the whole point of blockchain is to disintermediate yeah. the middlemen. And so we've seen with certain, certain, uh, with certain exchanges recently where exchanges become bankrupt, where those people that bought Bitcoin, because it's not in their wallet and it's an account on the centralized exchange, because that exchange went bankrupt, I no longer have that Bitcoin because I never had control over it. It's now an asset that's part of the bankruptcy proceedings. So if you are going to um, buy and invest in cryptocurrencies, then one of the things that I would tell you to do is learn about how to set up your own wallet, which is called a hot wallet. So a hot wallet exists on your cell phone or it could be like a USB thing. One of the big companies that sell these USB hot wallets is a company called Ledger, Ledger X. So you can go buy a $40 crypto hot wallet where you control the, the keys to that wallet. So when you buy something on Uniswap or when you buy something on Coinbase, you transfer it to that hot wallet and now you control it in perpetuity. So if that crypto exchange that you bought it for where it resides, let's use Coinbase, for example, let's say you have two Bitcoins on Coinbase and Coinbase goes belly under, you lost those Bitcoin. But if you were to buy the Bitcoin on Coinbase, then transfer it immediately to your hot wallet. Now you control it. So if Coinbase were to ever go belly up, you still have your Coinbase, your your Bitcoins on your wallet yourself. All right. All right. No, man, that's good stuff, man. And hey, we, we definitely going to have to have you back just to uh, I'm pretty sure people are going to uh, love this episode, especially to take uh uh, on the whole cryptocurrency, the blockchain thing from somebody who, I mean, again, this space is relatively new, but uh, I'm not sure if you would call yourself a subject matter expert. I look at you as a subject matter expert. I'm certainly because, a subject matter expert. Yeah, because yeah, sure. you've been you've been uh, doing this stuff since the inception. So, uh, again, I, I always, when I kind of go do things, I like to learn from people who are not only on the ground level, but are SMEs on this you know, particular topic. And uh, again, going back to the real estate thing, when I kind of start learning more about commercial real estate. I learned from somebody who had 4,000 units worth 300 million. So mm -hmm. you would consider him to be a subject matter expert if he owns hundreds of million dollars in the type of real estate that I'm looking to get. So I think a lot of people are going to love that take and just love this interview, especially as it relates to the blockchain and cryptocurrency take from somebody who's an SME in that subject. So we may have to have you on to kind of, of to break down this stuff because uh, we didn't even get a chance to get off into NFTs and Mm -hmm. uh, I know we're kind of running out of time here. Uh, so I just want to kind of see as we're you know, kind of wrapping up things, where can people find you? Where can people follow you? Do you have social media? Is it, uh, I guess, where can people reach out to you or, or just kind of, or just follow you to see updates, uh, whether it's on this blockchain cryptocurrency space, or just kind of see what you, uh, we'll see, we'll see what you're up to. Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, if any of your followers have any questions, they could certainly reach out to me on Twitter uh, at Samir Patel law. 
So it's just Samir Patel Law, all one word, at Samir Patel Law. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. My DMs are open. Feel free to, to send me a message. Any friend and viewer of David Spears is a friend and viewer of mine. So certainly reach out. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn as well, Samir Patel. I, I'm a hall and a night here in Miami. Feel free to reach out. Um, and I'd certainly be happy to come back. I know that I mean, we did. We certainly didn't talk about blockchain technology uh, enough. So right. um, if there is a, if there is a, a certain mass of people that, that want to know more, then I'd be more than happy to, to come back and do another full hour just on blockchain technology. For sure, for sure. And I'll put those uh, social media social media handles in the description so people can, uh, they will have those to be able to click on and go to. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think uh, definitely with, uh, with regard to, uh, you know, obviously the Everyday Investor, the channel is about, you know, investing in yourself to acquire your skills, mm -hmm. which obviously you have done. And then just being able to take that uh, earning potential, that increased earning potential and invest in different things. Uh, obviously you have done that with the 401k. And uh, I know we kind of, I don't want to say we're down another rabbit hole because I, I think it was a necessary rabbit hole because a lot of people, especially these days, appear to be getting uh, duped into uh, investing in crypto, investing in blockchain, and they have little to no understanding of what's yeah. going on. So I know it's something that you invest into uh, in some capacity. And uh, again, obviously, your take as far as, you know, to make sure if you do do this, you have the money to lose and not affect you. Uh, so I think that part of it was uh, very timely, but also just man, make sure you understand whether it's open source coding and understanding what's going on with the wallets and have a, having a hot wallet. I think though that, that, that type of information is, is key so that people uh, who may do want to kind of play in this space uh, are going, going about it in an informed uh, manner. Cause I'm all about informing the viewer, especially when you're talking about investment vehicles. Uh, that's what I'm all about. Uh, Cause I, I, I do think, you know, that's not going anywhere. Crypto is not going anywhere. No. Blockchain is not going anywhere. And if people are going to continue to play in the space and get into the space, I think they need to know kind of what's going on. So I'll be interested in get, get in the comments and reading them and uh, kind, of, kind of seeing uh, what that where that leads us. So I guess with that being said, as we wrap up, do you have any other, uh, I guess, points or thing you want to leave the audience with? I'll, again, I'll definitely put your social media handle in the description. A portion of uh, the video once it drops and uh, yeah, I guess I'll leave you with any last words. Uh, well, I mean, it, first off, thank you for the opportunity to come uh, mm -hmm. on your podcast. It's a great time. Always great to talk to you and talk about, you know, the subject matter. It's something I'm really enthusiastic and passionate about. Uh, and so, yeah, I, the, my last words um, until we have our next uh, talk on blockchain technology, but if you want to learn about blockchain technology right now, um, key phrases to, to, to research up on are, are know your coin or not your keys, not your coin. Um, so again, not your keys, not your coin. Take a look at that. And then also learn about hot wallets and cold storage wallets. Um, by learning those two things, you're, you're certainly well on your way um, to becoming a blockchain expert. Okay. No, that's good stuff. So with that being said, I think that's a great point to end. With that being said, uh, hopefully the audience, uh, you all, the TEI family, uh, got a lot out of uh, this interview. I think this was our longest one, and I think it was necessary because uh, Samir dropped a lot of jewels, a lot of nuggets uh, for us to take with us and apply, and hopefully uh, you know, get to the point where we're uh, earning more and investing more. And uh, until next time, take care, everyone. Bye, guys.